Right, so it was in one way, one researcher, Meredith Chivers, who I kind of happened upon as I was writing that earlier book about eight years ago now in 2005. And she was doing such fascinating research into women's desire, kind of taking that old Freudian question, what do women want, and looking at it through a woman's lens. And I wanted, once having spent time with her, to then continue her journey. She would ultimately say to me, I, Meredith, am kind of shaking the foundations of the way we think about women's sexuality. And that was kind of an irresistible uh, statement. I wanted to just follow her research, then branch out to other researchers, most of them women. And finally, and this is important to spend lots of time interviewing everyday women about their erotic lives and threading their stories ultimately through the book. Right, well, when I first met Meredith, I really did have this sense that she was trying, although of course this, the effort is in a sense quixotic, but on the other hand, valiant, trying to look beyond nurture, beyond the learned, beyond what we're sort of imprinted with through culture and get at some underlying sense of what makes us as human beings, and then particularly women work sexually. Now, however, that plethysmograph, that little device that measures physically how turned on women are, doesn't speak 100% to a capital T truth about desire. No, not at all. But it is often, as her research and other researchers' results indicate, a kind of wake-up call that maybe our culture is still constraining, distorting, getting in the way of our understanding of women's sexuality. Well, I do think of it as leveling in the sense that it stands as kind of unsettling, maybe a little bit of a warning, maybe a little bit of a fear inducer for men and our fragile egos. I mean, one of the things that was consistently and increasingly called into question as I spent time with researchers and with women is this idea that we've been fed now and basically accepted, I think, largely as a culture, which is that while men are programmed by evolution to spread their cheap seed and to be promiscuous, that relatively speaking anyway, women are driven sexually to seek out one good man and thus are fairly well suited to monogamy. Well, how soothing to me as a man, and really how comforting to society, because we end up through that myth, and I think it really is a myth, ascribing to women the role of social backbone or social glue, and how nice that is to think that half the population is programmed to be that way. I think science is telling us something very different, and I do think ultimately empowering about the way sexuality works within women. It may not feel so empowering to men at first. I hope that we can get past that moment of threat or fragility, but certainly I think ultimately the, the candid conversation that I hope my book will lead to, I think might lead to more electricity, more erotic understanding for all of us. There's a slightly different balance of force at play on either side of the Atlantic, you know, and on my side in the States, we've still got that kind of evangelical religious force then converging with the scientific force of evolutionary psychology, which you know, gives us that male promiscuity, females programmed to be more monogamous lesson. It's those forces, that convergence that I was writing about, but I still think on both sides of the Atlantic, we still live with a kind of double standard. And I think that's what I was hearing over and over again from women researchers that still, despite all appearances of a kind of, you know, restraints off sort of culture, that much more permission is still given to men, young men, uh, right on from boyhood onward, to be sexual and less so for women. And I think that does get in the way of our understanding. And so the book tries to do two things. One is to show experiment after experiment, like Chiris is, 
that really begin to debunk that, to pull away those blinders. And then just listening to everyday women tell their stories, I think, uh, kind of ratifies that, adds you know, weight in a personal way to what that science is revealing. Over the last 15 years or so, there's been this surge of women mostly looking into women's sexuality, and that's what allows me to write this book. But yes, I think there still is an uneasiness, and you can see that I was constantly flying from New York to Canadian cities, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver primarily, uh, to spend time with researchers. I was not simply getting on the train to go to Princeton or Yale or Harvard. And the reason I think is that there's still this uneasiness with, in the States at least, with looking at desire, particularly women's desire itself. There's of course plenty of money for the evolutionary psych idea that we've alluded to now of dividing the sexes in terms of what each really wants, but not much to look closely at the workings of desire. There should be skepticism about me as a man writing this book. I worried about it. It could seem foolish. It could seem arrogant. I could simply seem to be falling into a long line of men who have proclaimed about women's sexuality. I hope what gets past that is that this is a book filled with women's voices, that it was really an eight-year journey for me, starting from that quite rare journalistic position of not knowing. Of course, journalists tend to start with half knowing and finding what's going to confirm what's, you know, the thesis that's already forming. In this case, I really didn't know, asked and asked and asked, you know, dozens of different ways. And so I hope that that process led to a kind of candor from the people I was with, both scientists and women, in trying to answer this question that Freud posed long ago, that Meredith Chivers decided to go after again in our times, and that of course there's not one answer to, but there are some questions that need deeper exploration, and I hope the book provides that exploration and then leads to a new kind of conversation.